Hello everybody. If you don't know who I am, my name is Kate. I'm from the Lower Backwards LCDC. So many thanks to you all for joining us today. Um, before I introduce our presenters, I might just do a little check to see if everybody can hear me. If you notice um, down in the bottom right hand corner of the chat box, there's a little hand symbol. Um, if you click on it, it's the status symbol. If you can hear me, if you could just push the agree button so I can see if everyone's status is good. Okay, well, it's two out of seven, <laughs> three. Oh, that's good. Climbing. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, a few people maybe haven't joined us yet. Maybe they're waiting in the wings. So I might just wait one more minute till exactly 4.30 and then we can, uh, can get going. Okay, well, I think I'll make a start. Um, so you may have noticed by now that you can hear me, I hope, you can all hear me, uh, but not speak. And we've done that deliberately so that we can keep uh, things moving along at a good pace today. Um, you can still definitely ask questions though. Um, just type your question in at any time in the chat box. And both Andrew and John have said they're happy to ask questions during the presentation. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Um, if you do run into any technical difficulties, you can indicate that to me just by, again, by that status symbol on the bottom right hand side, there's a little um, symbol that says I need help. So just put that up there. Um, I'll do my best to help. And if not, don't worry, because we are going, we are recording this webinar, and I will be sending it out all to you next week. So you won't miss out. Um, okay, so I think that's enough from me. I'm going to um, introduce our presenters. I have great pleasure in, in introducing to you Dr. Andrew Thompson, the Chair of Animal Science from Murdoch University, and uh, John Young of Farming Systems Anal Analysis. Both Andrew and John have collectively many years of experience in working on sheep productivity projects, including in the areas of sheep nutrition, genetics, management, economics, and efficiency. Today's webinar will focus on management guidelines and feeding standards that have developed, they have developed for maternal use that aim to optimise productivity per hectare. Andrew will take us through some key findings of, from some of the lifetime maternal research that he's undertaken, whilst John will discuss the economics and development of management guidelines. So, uh, it's over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Kate. Um... I, I can't see who, who's online, but I, I'm, I'm just guessing I probably don't know a lot of you, but look, a little bit about my background is um, uh, I'm, maybe some of you have been involved in the Lifetime New Management Program. Um, I guess that's that was a major project um, almost 20 years ago, believe it or not, um, and both John and I were involved in that. It, well, Lifetime Wool was the research project from which the Lifetime New Management Extension Program was developed. And I guess over, you know, particularly over the last decade, we've seen a pretty major change in the, I guess, the demographic of our sheep flock. You know, something like 30% of ewes now are non-merino non um, and about 50% of, of slaughter lambs are, are out of, you know, maternal ewes. So I guess a natural progression was to, I guess, once we'd sort of developed guidelines for merino ewes that have been pretty well adopted across the industry was, you know, there were some gaps that we needed to fill um, from a maternal's point of view. Um, and, I'll, and I'll work my I'll work my way through that. But, but lifetime maternals was a pretty pretty big project. It started in two thousand and fourteen, um, and with partners all around the country, um, funded by Meat and Livestock Australia. And, and from a WA point of view, I make special reference to David and Lynn and Andrew Slade um, down there at Mount Barker, who hosted a major a major project for a couple of years. And I guess I guess the maybe that's the point one point here is the scale of this work you know what i'm going to report on today was so uh four different sites across the country um across two years um you know with sort of a thousand ewes in each 
Um, so it's a reasonable scale in terms of, um, I guess, the scientific rigour, the numbers behind some of what I'll, I'll, I'll just gloss over. But, but you know, lifetime view management, as I said, um, well, what, how are we going to structure today, sorry, is, is why, why maternals, um, you know, uh, just to, to, to touch on some of the key outcomes from the research. We won't have a lot of time, so happy to also discuss it uh, offline if, if someone wants to follow up. And then, as Kate said, John will come in and talk about some of the economics and, and what it all means in terms of how you might go about managing uh, maternal use if that's what you're running. Um, lifetime new management, as I said, it sort of was launched in about 2006. Um, something like 4,000 farmers around the country have been through that, about 12, 13 million ewes. So it's, it's had a major impact on our industry. And I guess the guidelines that came out of that project for Merinos were essentially join in condition score three, lamb in condition score three for a single, and a little bit fatter if, you're, if you've got twins. There were some subtle differences in how you um, get, to pregnant, get through pregnancy. You know, if you were a very late lammer and you could regain weight in late pregnancy, then you could you could justify losing some weight in late pregnant in early pregnancy because you know you could gain it later on off green feed. But even you know even though LTM was based on merinos, about thirty three percent of the participants had maternal use, and interestingly, those um, farmers with maternal use actually achieved more from the program um, than those with merino use. But nevertheless, there were some um, some justified um, concern that the guidelines were wrong, and, and that that's fair fair comment because they weren't developed from from maternals, and they are obviously quite a different beast. And so when we we asked what I guess advisors were doing in the absence of guidelines for maternal use, fifty percent said they were using the merino targets, and fifty percent said they were making up their own um, based on based on experience. So I guess that was a little bit about, the, I guess, why the project came about. Essentially, a meat version of, of LTEM um, for you who, for uh, I guess, those online who, who may have done LTEM. Um, what I'm going to step, do is, is just step through. I said I've only got, um, you know, 15, 20 odd minutes. Um, then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for some questions at the end. I just really wanted to step through, I guess, the reproductive cycle, um, you know, what in terms of yeah, yeah, ewe nutrition through pregnancy, what effects it has on birth weights, what effects it has on survival, land growth, carryover reproduction, and, and highlight some of the differences um, to, to what we found, as I said, 15, 20 years ago um, with, with merinos. And, and happy to, I think Kate may have said, if you've got questions throughout uh, or whatever, you know, chip, chip them in uh, if, if you would like. But I guess what we found was, so what I'm, what we're reporting on here is the first two years of the of the of the research. As I said, where there were the four sites around the country um, over over those two years, and what we found across you know six or seven, eight thousand lambs um, was that there were pretty predictable effects of nutrition um, and therefore live weight or condition score change in the ewe. Consistent effects of of live weight condition score change in early or late pregnancy on birth weights. Okay, so a couple of things, you know, it's, it's not all about late pregnancy. What you do to your ewe in, in early pregnancy, early mid-pregnancy, let's say to about day 100, can certainly influence lamb birth weight. And if the ewe lost or gained, for that matter, 10 kilos over that period of time, um, the lambs were about a quarter of a kilo heavier. That's the, that's the 0.25 here. So 0.25 per kilo birth weight per 10 kilo change in, in ewe live weight. If, if that change in, in nutrition and new live weight was in late pregnancy, then the effect was about 0.38, okay? So yes, a bigger effect of late pregnancy nutrition, but um, you know, early pregnancy can, can also have a, have a bearing. And that is, that is very, very similar um, to what we found with Merinos, okay? Those, again, if, if you had done LTEM, or, although maybe some time ago, you know, those corresponding numbers in Merinos were 0.34, so 0.34 of a kilo per 10 kilos if the change happened in early pregnancy, or 0.46 
um, of a kilo if the change happened in late pregnancy. So maybe some evidence there that maternals were, I guess, better able to buffer or, or, or direct nutrients to their lamb, okay? So in other words, the changes in birth weight associated with a change in new live weight were, were a bit less um, in, in, the, in the maternals than, than in the merinos. Um, again, similar to what we found in merinos, the, the response of the single twin triple lamb was exactly the same. In other words, you know, a change in birth, a change in new live weight has a similar effect on the change in birth weight of the lambs, regardless of whether it's a single twin triple. It's not as if the triples are more vulnerable, more susceptible. They all respond by, you know, on average, the 0 0.25, 0 0.38. So a little bit of new, I guess, new new knowledge there, although the, the differences weren't, um, weren't massive. What we also found in, in actually a separate experiment, there was no effects of, of feed on offer in the last couple of weeks of pregnancy. So what I, what I mean there, I guess the question we posed was, could you run ewes a bit harder through the bulk of pregnancy um, and essentially defer pasture and accumulate a heap of feed and then put them onto, you know, two tonne or, or whatever it might be, you know, in those last few weeks and essentially overcome the, the penalty that you'd, you'd sort of set up before that. And, and we found you couldn't. In, in other words, you know, if you had, if you'd, I guess underfed the ewe, let's say, or not not hit your targets through the bulk of pregnancy. If you if the ewes then went on to six hundred kilos, a thousand, two thousand, there was actually no no effect on birth weight, you know, of of that extra feed on offer, that big boost in intake over that last couple of weeks. I guess didn't didn't overcome, um, you know, some of the you know it wasn't a get out of jail card. I guess is one is one way of putting it. We looked at lamb survival. Um, hopefully that comes up. That should be yep. Um, again, very familiar for the sheep sheep uh, farmers online. You know, pretty pretty similar curves. I'm sure to what you would have seen in other you know sort of extension programs and, and, and whatnot over the years. Um, there is a few subtle differences again here. Um, the the red and green line there. So red single, green greens twin. Okay. Um, Though I guess the survival of single and twin maternals was quite similar um, at the same birth weight, okay? And, and we, what we see in merinos is, is that there is a penalty of being a twin. So, you know, a five kilo in merinos, you know, a five kilo twin has a, you know, 10% lower survival than a five kilo single because it's a twin, right? Whereas in maternals, that wasn't so evident. Well, statistically, those, those lines are different. I mean, you know, Biologically, practically, they're not okay. There's only a couple of you know one or two percent difference in survival if if you if you can get the same birth weight. So that was that was a, a little bit different. Whereas triples are about ten percent lower survival um, for the same birth weight. I guess the key point here is about what were the average birth weights? Where do they sit on that those lines? And across all these you know, these thousands and thousands of lambs. Um, the average birth weight for twi for singles is about six kilos. Okay, so very much up on the flat part of the curve. Okay, so up here somewhere, so you can shift birth weight of, of singles. Okay, and it really didn't have too much effect um, on survival. Twi twins not much different. Okay, their their average birth weight was around five. Yes, it did vary from site to site. You know, we use different genetics across our four sites, but but on average, again, twins were pretty robust. Um, because they're just bigger than a, than a merino, and that's not that's not just a, a live weight thing, okay? You know what? You know a sixty kilo maternal ewe, we would predict would have a bigger lamb than a sixty kilo merino ewe, okay? There's something. It's not just a live weight effect. I guess what we, what else we saw in terms of differences between merinos and maternals, and um, is that if these these you know down here when we get down to four kilos and so forth, I guess the 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 slope of these lines, the drop in survival as we get lighter birth weight lambs is not so drastic in in maternals compared to merinos. Now that might all be, you know, that's pretty obvious. We knew that. I guess we we didn't really know exactly the shapes of these curves, which were needed to enable John to then go ahead and model 
I guess what how we exactly we should manage manage our maternal use to make the most money per hectare. Okay, so so the in a, in a nutshell, the maternal lambs are more robust. They're bigger to start with, and then they're less less um, sensitive, I guess, um, to lower birth weights. Okay, they survive better um, despite despite uh, lighter weights. I, interestingly, with I sort of um, if I sort of devo- you know I come up with this sort of I call it a critical birth weight, but it was, I just define that as equal to about to about when survival was ninety percent of the maximum. Okay, so it's a bit of a random number, um, but try to put the merino maternal thing in context. For maternals, the average birth weight of twins is about a half a kilo above that critical number in terms. In, in other words, half a kilo before the before the cliff. With merinos, they are about half a kilo below this critical number. Okay, so they are on the slippery part of the curve, and that's why, I guess, manipulating new nutrition and therefore affecting birth weight and survival is a bigger issue in in merinos um, than than in maternals. I guess that's a little bit of the biology, but what's it actually mean? And something that you can do something about, i.e., condition score. Um, and these are the, the, the um, what we call the plot level. So, you know, let's take Dave, you know, the, the work at David Slade's place or David and Lynn Slade's. You know, I think we had, some, um, what did we have, 12 to 15 plots, um, sort of five hectares with 50 ewes on, something like that's the sort of scale we're talking about. Um, and so we've got all these plots of ewes that were either condition score 2.6. We've got another... Um, two or three plots that are uh, 2.8, another two or three plots at 3.2, another two or three plots at 3.6. Uh, it's that data from which we generate these curves. Now, there are some differences here between between merinos and maternals. Um, I guess let's start with the twin response, okay? Um, as, I, as I just alluded to, the, the, the twin, as in the green line, is, is essentially flatter in in maternals than in merinos, as I as I was sort of alluding to in the previous in the previous slide. So in in this situation here, a, a condition score change in the maternal u at lambing changed survival by about eleven or twelve percent. Okay, so if we went from two point five to three point five, a big difference, I know. You know, survival change by let's say twelve percent, weaning rate by twenty four percent. Okay, out of your twin ewes, that corresponding number in merinos is about a twenty percent change in survival, forty um, percent change in marking rate. Okay, across that same same spectrum. So, basically, the merino is is just steeper, um, uh, uh, as as I alluded to before, because it's on that slippery part of the slippery part of the birth weight survival curve. So that's one difference. I guess the other difference is in, the, in merinos, this red line, i.e. The, the, the singles, is actually a positive line, okay? So in single-born merino um, uh, lambs, you know, uh, you know there, there's a benefit of having, having the ewes fatter, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's less than it is in twins, obviously. But, but in the maternal U, if anything, it goes the other way, particularly when we got above condition score three, sorry, 3.3, 3, 3.4, um, you know, when we start getting U's up to 3.6, 3.7, okay, we're seeing, you know, five to 10% declines um, in survival, you know, overfat, dystopia, um, and often, you know, maybe even U death as well. So, so there are quite, you know, significant differences, I guess, in the, in just how, Maternal versus merino use, single versus twin respond um, to to condition score at lambing. How are we going for time? Okay, and I guess so. That that to me probably suggests that the case for pregnancy scanning um, is is even stronger in in maternals than merinos. Okay, because you've got one line positive, one line negative. Um, if there's ever going to be a case to pull them apart and differentially manage. Um, it's, it's in a scenario like that. And yet, believe it or not, only about 25% of producers um, scan for multiples, and it's actually no different in maternals compared to merinos. Okay, so it's not as if 
the current situation out there is that all, mat all maternal producers scan for, for, for twins. They don't. Um, a quarter do. Okay, so huge scope there, I think. And John, John is starting to put some numbers on that as well. I've got a little bit to go, um, but so I guess that's the, the covering the birth weight survival responses. Um, what about lamb growth? Obviously, you know, probably more important in a in a um, in a maternal system or a, or a meat focused system. Um, so what we're what we're doing here is is looking at you know how does nutrition during pregnancy, um, early, mid, or or late pregnancy, how does that influence lamb growth rates? Um, and, and ultimately weaning weights, okay? So if you've had ewes that were managed differentially during pregnancy and then all put together, you know, what's the carryover effect on their milking ability um, and, and growth rates? And what we, what we see here using the same sort of units, I guess, is, is what, we, what I expressed before was that if a ewe lost 10 kilos in early pregnancy um, and then they were managed together thereafter, their, their lambs are about at one and a half kilos lighter at weaning weight, okay? So, you know, there is an effect of how you manage a ewe in the first 100 days of pregnancy on subsequent milking ability and, and lamb growth rates, something of that sort of magnitude, one and a half kilos per, per 10 kilos. And that affects, with, with lamb growth, early mid-pregnancy actually has a bigger effect than late pregnancy, and we saw exactly the same um, in, in Moreno's. Um, so if that if that 10 kilo difference was created in late pregnancy, um, that the impacts on weaning weight was was only about 1.1 1. Um, 1 .1 kilo. Um, those corresponding numbers in merinos are about 1.9 and 1.3. In other words, there's there's evidence here again that the maternal U was better able to buffer. Um, or, or protect, let's say, um, you know, milk off her back maybe, but better able to, to, to look after the lamb, okay, despite maybe being in, in, uh, being in poorer condition at some stage through pregnancy. So in other words, maternals were less sensitive to live weight loss um, compared to merinos. Like birth weight, we see no difference in, in how singles, twins, triples respond, okay? They're all... You know the changes in weaning weight are all all similar, um, regardless of, of uh, their their birth type. So I guess that's the that can provide some insight on what the impacts of pregnancy management and therefore condition score at lambing has on 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 lamb growth, uh, on lamb growth rates. Yeah. So the, the big drivers of, of lamb growth are really feed on offer through lactation. That may not you may not be surprised by that. Um, that's, that's the same as merinos, um, and you know maximum growth rates at around two thousand kilos. Okay, so it's it's a fair bit, but probably probably possible down very possible down in your your neck of the woods um, compared to other parts of, of the state. Um, but you know about two thousand kilos is is maximum growth rates. Um, but also sensitive to percent clover. Again, you know that. Um, I guess what this project did is put a bit of a number on that. Um, and for, a, I, I actually don't, I think it's quite a nice little rule of thumb. About a 1% change in clover, a 1% increase in clover in the pasture, increased growth rates by about one gram per day. Now that might all sound a bit academic, but you know, if you've got pastures, you know, 30% clover, if those lambs can grow 30, 30 grams a day quicker for, for 80 days, you know, there's your two and a half, three kilo heavier weaning weight, okay, through nothing to do with feed on offer, just purely the, the composition of the pasture. What we also saw here is the ability of, um, again, another example of maternals being able to, to, I guess, being less vulnerable, let's say, to low food. As I, as I said, the maximum feed on maximum growth rates were achieved about at two thousand kilos. If if there was only a thousand, okay, what we found is that the, the growth rate of the maternal lambs was compromised by about six, you know, five or six percent. Okay, so if you had a thousand kilos rather than two thousand, the lamb growth rates and weaning weights were were down by five or six percent. The, the corresponding number in merinos was about 15%, okay? Similarly, if we only had 500 kilos in, in through lactation, um, like I'm guessing it's gonna be a lot, you know, many, many farmers more inland this year, 
the number for maternals was 12% versus about 30% in merinos. Okay, so again, evidence all along the chain, or the or at least the the early you know, the the reproductive cycle, where maternals were just able to better buffer or appear to be able to better buffer and 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 look after their lamb. You know, can can twins catch up? I guess is one question. The answer is no. I mean, twins will be you know twins born together, reared together, but were about six kilos lighter than single lambs. But by by you know, differentially managing again and and giving you know more food, more legume, etc., you know that gap can certainly be close to two you know to two kilos, something like that. By and I guess hence ending up with a a more uniform cohort of lambs. Um, just I got two slides to go, two or three. So how am I going for time? Yep, yeah, not too bad. Um, what we also found, so I guess that's some of the basic, um, you know, production responses. Um, what what I failed to say at the start of the presentation was the, this project was going to be for two years and it ended up going for four or five because what happened was, again, looking back to how we ran the Lifetime Wool Project 20 odd years ago, we did, we did all the biological responses, which is, is I've just given you a bit of a snapshot of. Um, and then we handball all those numbers to John, who would then, um, I guess, you know, as I said, develop the condition score targets from that, um, based on our understanding of how animals respond to, to feed on offer and, and so forth. When when we did that, I guess the models that John uses or, and everyone else in around the country, I guess they couldn't adequately represent what we were seeing in the paddock. In other words these maternal animals were growing a whole lot quicker than what we thought was possible. And so that that sort of meant we had to go back to the drawing board a little bit and there was another couple of years of research, I guess, to try to better understand some of the biology of these modern maternals. Or mater and what I mean there is, you know, how much can they eat? Um, what's their maintenance requirement? How they partition energy? Um, those sorts of things. And John may touch on that as well. but. I, get, I think what's most relevant of interest, I think, to producers is um, that, that these animals consumed about 25%, their, what we call their potential intake, what could they eat when there was plenty of feed around, they consumed about 25% more than I guess we we had previously thought was, was the case based on what's called the Australian feeding standards. If the feed, le feed level, food levels, feed on offer levels were low, i.e. 500, then that was about 35%. Okay, so they can they were they were eating a whole lot more um, than we thought was was um, previously uh, the case. What we also see is that you know twin ewes were, were capable of maintaining um, weight on you know very low levels of feed on offer. You know four to six hundred kilos um, and gaining weight um, on you know significant weight on 800 to 1,000 in late pregnancy. Again, things that we probably hadn't seen. That all that was so evident um, with the merinos. I guess that just quickly, they, what we also saw was this amazing capacity to to compensate. Um, um, what I, what I mean there is that the ewes that were a, a, a condition score different at lambing, right? So if we had ewes at lambing that were scored two and a half versus score three, two and a half versus three and a half, let's say and then they'll run together, that one condition score difference had shrunk to about half a condition score of weaning and about a quarter of a condition score the following joining, okay? Because of this big intake capacity, particularly when they were, you know, a bit, bit leaner, okay, um, they could make massive compensatory uh, uh, gain and, and, and eliminate a lot of that difference. I'll just go through this one quickly. I guess what it also meant and, and the context here is this this ability to to um, to, to regain and, and the impacts on the following joining, the the condition score and face value, the condition score versus reproductive rate responses. Okay, so condition score at the U versus um, scanning performance effectively fetuses per hundred U uh, joined. The the blue the blue line the average is pretty similar to what we see in merinos. So about 20% extra scanning, uh, 20, you know, an extra 20 fetuses per 100 years joined for every condition, extra condition score um, at, at joining time. 
What we also see is that those which had a twin the previous year, if they could be managed to get back to the, an equivalent um, condition score, they would give about 15% higher scanning at the following joining. Okay, Again, very, very similar numbers to what we saw in, in or we see um, in, in Merino. So, so nothing, um, nothing totally new there or different in terms of how, um, or it appeared to be nothing that different in terms of how the different breeds might respond um, to condition score. Um, what, what we also did find, and I might, or maybe I will, hopefully we will have time. I was going to skip this slide, but I will go, I will go through it. It is the second last slide I've got, and then maybe we can have a question or two, or, or, or but John will also take over. What, what this just data from our two, ex, two different experiments, and what I'm showing here is that, you know, U condition score at Lamming, um, 2.5 versus 3.8. So we deliberately managed them to achieve that, okay? Um, as I just alluded to, this big capacity to compensate, you know, from, from lambing um, through to the following joining. So that difference of 1.3 condition scores, you know, 20, over 20 kilos, because in the maternals, each condition score was about 15 kilos. You know, the, the gap was massively closed, and we saw that in both years. Surprisingly, despite this relatively small difference in 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 you know, condition score, there was still quite a large difference in, in scanning performance, okay? So going back to the previous graph, if there's only 0.2 of a condition, condition score difference in, in, in uh, at the following joining, you might only expect a four or 5% difference in scanning. And yet we're seeing 14, you know, 10 to 15, let's say. And so just you know, what, what that made us do is basically go back and, and what, I guess what we worked out from that is that how ewes get to their scanning condition score, scanning weight also has an effect, okay? So if we get differences in, in condition score at joining, let's say, um, it mat how they got there over the previous 12 months um, has an impact. And, and the most sensitive period is actually what they did the previous pregnancy, okay? So we can get very, we can get use from year to year, we can have use of, you know, condition score three and get very different results because it, it's also influenced by how, how they got there. I, I, I have got a, can't go into that in, in any detail, but we could come back to it if there's questions. So just in summary, I guess if we could um, wrap that up, I mean, what, you know, we found predictable effects of live weight profile on birth weights and weaning weights, as we had from Reno, some subtle differences there. Um, certainly, you know, go, uh, uh, there's a number of bits of evidence there that the, the lambs are, um, the, out of maternals are more resilient. Um, the ewes do a better job at protecting the lamb, and then the lamb does a better job of living regardless. Um, clear evidence, you'd think that there could be a str even stronger case for differential management of singles and twins and, and indeed triples. Um, land growth, I think, is driven by feed on offer. Um, I think next in line is, is the amount of legume we've got in our pasture and then condition score um, at, at lambing itself. This huge capacity to compensate in maternals. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure all maternals aren't maternals and all merinos aren't merinos, so we've got to need to be a little bit cautious there, but at least for the sheep that we use in our experiments, um, which were largely composites, um, you know, this big capacity to compensate um, over, over the, you know, through lactation and, and post-weaning really does have an impact on what John's going to talk about um, in, in a second. And as I said, we, we worked, we, we found out too that the condition score profile over the 12-month period um, influences reproductive rate as well. It's not, it's not just the condition score they get to, um, it's, but it's how they, how they get there over the previous 12 months. I, that's a, a little bit academic in some sense, other than it sort of explains why we do get variation from year to year. Um, but I guess the, the relevance in the context of this talk is that it's, it's included in, I guess, the economic modelling that John's done to work out, I guess, how best we might manage maternals to, 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 to make money. So, Kate, that's enough from me. Um, so Matt's got a question there, I think. Um, weaning age on land growth rates post weaning between weaning age on land. 
Matt, I'll need to think about that one. Um, weaning age on land growth rate. Youngie, I don't know whether you've got a comment on that one. It's a bit of a handball. Weaning age. That's right. That's right. We didn't look at it in the trial, so there's no information from uh, from this project on on weaning age. And I guess other other work shows that that early weaning has less effect on the lamb. It's more about being able to manage the uh, manage the ewes recovery for for next for next joining is is more the the issue of, of weaning age than what it does to lamb growth rate. Better turn that on. Um, yeah, we didn't have data from this truck project or, or lifetime all uh, specifically, but the whole question about around uh, optimising weaning age is a is a is an interesting one or or an important one that I'm not sure we we have solid answers out of this project at least. Okay, so are there any other questions from from anyone, or we can carry on now with um, with John's presentation. Looks like everybody's got all the answers so far. <laughs> all right, um, we might move on then to, to John. Okay, well the, the next step of the project was to carry out some uh, analysis that was similar to lifetime, the, the lifetime wool analysis. Um, for those of you who have done the lifetime new management package, um, a very similar set of analyses were carried out using some whole farm models and we, we did it for two different regions, uh, one in the long growing season uh, area in, in Hamilton in, in southwest Victoria and looked at three different times of lambing and then a bit closer to home we also looked at two times of lambing in uh, in the Great Southern, in the sort of 500 to 600 millimetre rainfall zone, with a with a six month growing season, uh, the analysis was carried out with a, uh, a composite U genotype. The the on well, the in paddock and um, research was was done both with the composite U genotype plus um, a border Lester Merino at, at one of the the sites, but we went with the decision to to model the board, uh, sorry, the, the composite maternal. And, and we did it with a um, composite maternal made it to a terminal sire with all the progeny sold as finished lambs. And and we, although there'll be some effect of, of using that flock structure, we, we actually think that there's going to be more difference due to, um, as Andrew talked about, there's, there's a range of, when we say maternal, there's actually a range of genotypes being represented, and we think that that range of genotypes will have a have a much bigger effect than than the difference in flock structure. Um, so we we worked on an animal that had a uh, a weaning rate of around 140 percent, and and just a quick summary of what Andrew's just told you as far as the the aspects of the maternal that that affect. Uh, that affected the modelling. We, we've got an animal that's got a bigger appetite, sort of between 25 and 35% more consumed than, than we expected based on the sort of old trials. We also expected it, or we also measured them to, to be a lot less affected by um, fatness. So intake is a difficult thing to measure and so it hasn't, there isn't a lot of information around, but the old trials that had measured um, intake showed that that fat animals, sort of condition score four plus, uh, reduced their intake significantly, and and this trial showed that these maternal ewes weren't affected. 
So, um, so you put those two things together and what you've got is an animal that can gain a lot of weight and get up to very high condition score um, in, a, in a good spring flush. So condition scores four plus, four and a half, four, even above four and a half were, were seen in the trials and I expect that you see them on, on your farm if you, if you give them feed. We also saw a bit of variation within the maternal genotype in their partitioning to fat and protein, and you're probably quite happy for your use or for your lambs to partition into protein because it means they gain weight much quicker and turn into a meatier animal um, with, with less energy. But for your use, it means that in, uh, in summertime, they'll, they'll lose weight more quickly. Um, so it does affect your feed budget and how you set about getting the, the condition score guidelines that we'll talk about in a minute. But the interesting thing was that that variation in genotype, which we saw in the trial and we evaluated in the, in the project, didn't affect, um, didn't affect the outcomes or the, the condition score guidelines. Uh, so if we go on to the to the next slide, so the that and the analysis that we did um, included those uh, numbers that Andrew's just talked about, and we also did a sensitivity um, on on meat price between sort of plus and minus twenty five or thirty percent, grain price in the same sort of range. We also looked at um, different seasonal conditions, so different grazing intensity. And, and there was the two different environments and the, the five different times of lambing. And, and the guidelines that were developed, the condition score targets, were, were altered a little by those, that range that we considered. But, for, uh, but when you look at it from the big picture, the, the numbers were the same. And, and the, the, the analysis that, or the drivers of the analysis that underpin that conclusion were affected by the feed budget, so the cost of providing the feed for the ewes to achieve different condition scores, what happens to ewe mortality, what happens to lamb mortality, what happens to weaning weight and, and hence value of the lamb at sale, and, and also the last point that Andrew talked about, the, the effect of the profile on, on use um, scanning percentages. So there's, there was quite a lot of detail in the analysis, um, but we're quite lucky that the, that the profiles that were developed were, were consistent um, across those different scenarios that we, that we examined. And, and those, those targets are um, which on the next slide were that the, the condition score at landing was the key target. Of, of the numbers that changed as you change different scenarios, the one that varied very little was this condition score at landing. And so the target is that have your singles in condition score sort of 3, 3.1 and have the twins in condition score 3.3 to 3.5. And, and for those of you who have seen the lifetime new management guidelines, these numbers are very similar. So at, at lambing time, the, the targets are, are very similar. The difference is what happens between, can, between joining and, and, um, and lambing. Now, Andrew outlined that, that the maternal lamb is a, a more robust animal and that the, and that the maternal ewe seems to partition more of its energy towards the lamb. Um, so the lamb is less affected by the ewe losing weight than the, than the merino lamb. And, and that's all leading to the finding that that loss of condition through pregnancy um, is, is not an important part of the, the maternal guidelines, whereas it is a very important part of the merino guidelines, which, which are to maintain weight from joining to, to lambing. For the maternal, join in whatever condition score happens at the end of spring, 
based on what sort of season you're having and what sort of stocking rate you're you're running, and then manage them through that pregnancy period um, to achieve the the condition score target for lambing. And there's two provisos for that: is that that you don't have excessive weight loss through mortality through um, pregnancy leading to mortality due to pregtox. So that means you can't have the lambs get uh, sorry, the, the ewes get too heavy, like condition score 4.8 or something would be very difficult to take all that weight off to get back to the condition score targets without uh, having some preg tox problems. And the other is that there's not insufficient weight loss leading to an increased risk of, of large lambs. So, um, so otherwise you, you achieve the the uh, whatever condition at joining as occurs. So to put that into a into a picture for a sort of summer joining flock, uh, might be hitting also with a summer summer joining flock, you're joining close to the the peak live weight that's occurred, peak condition score. So you might be up at four plus at at joining, and and the idea is obviously that singles and twins have to lose. Uh, will have to be managed together up until scanning and then post scanning the, the singles continue to lose weight to get down to condition score three and and live weight loss in the in the twins is uh, is, is stopped because they're the most sensitive to, to pregnancy toxemia. Now if if the spring is not so good and and you get you don't get to the same um, We'll get to a lower condition score peak and and join at say condition score 3.5 then the the target is that the lambing condition score stays the same but your management through um through pregnancy changes so well, through early pregnancy changes so you're in this case you're much closer to to live weight maintenance um, through early pregnancy so that you can achieve um, the lambing targets. So, <clears throat> um, so just as a comparison of the maternal and merino guidelines, for those of you who are familiar with the, with the merino guidelines, is that the condition score targets at, at lambing are very similar um, and the, it's the profile during pregnancy is where the difference are. So the merinos, as I said before, lamb at the same condition score as you join, whereas the maternals, it's um, losing weight through pregnancy is is part of the most profitable management of these maternal animals. So if you've got abundant feed prior to joining, in the in the merino system, the most profitable thing to do was to try and move that abundant feed. Um, from pre-joining to the post-joining period to, to help maintain your use through pregnancy. Don't let them get so heavy and, and try and maintain them post-joining. Uh, Whereas in the maternal system, the most profitable use of that feed is to allow them to get heavier, join heavier, and then lose more weight through pregnancy. We, we did try, or we would have liked to have... Um, um, done some analysis to compare these guidelines with the with the um, uh, with what is being done on farm, but we we don't have a database of 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 what sort of condition scores animals are, are following on farm. So we compared the these new maternal guidelines with with how profitable it would be if you'd followed the, the lifetime new management guidelines. Um, and and what we found was that the, these new guidelines for maternal type sheep are sort of seven to eleven dollars more valuable um, than than the old lifetime new guidelines of maintaining um, maintaining weight through pregnancy. But but it did vary so so the number was quite consistent and the targets are quite consistent between regions. But if we have a look at the next slide, the reasons behind that finding uh, are actually quite different. 
and and so if so, so the different coloured parts of the bar are, are what's driving um, what's driving profitability, and and if you're in a in an autumn lambing system in in either of the short or the longer growing season environment, then the the blue bar, which is which is the feed budget, how much it costs you in supplement and, and stocking rate, is the main driver of of the difference between those two profiles. Whereas if you're in a uh, more in a, a spring lambing, a winter or spring lambing system, then the orange bar and the grey bar. So the orange bar is is ewe sale value, so weight of the ewes plus ewe mortality, uh, and the grey bar, which is which is weaning percentage, so that's um, conception of the ewe and, and lamb survival are the much bigger drivers of um, of profitability. So if if you're a if if you're a farmer in a specific environment, you can look at the bar that's most important to you. But if you're a, a an extension agent, then then what it means is that. That although the message is consistent, the reason behind the message is is a little different. And Andrew talked about the, the differential management and the value of differential management, and and that's being driven by that information that he presented you, and and with and the preliminary economic analysis indicated that that the value of scanning is is a bit greater for for maternals than it is for merinos. Um, but there's another project that's going on at the moment and and we're, we're looking into that uh, or that question in a, in a bit more detail in that project. So probably uh, by the end of this year, we should have have some uh, more solid analysis to, to talk about the, the value of scanning in a maternal flock. But we do know that, that um, in order to achieve the targets, you need to be scanning. That there's, um, you, you can't, you can't uh, achieve the targets of having twins heavier than singles um, unless you're scanning. And I think I'm going to go over this slide fairly quickly, um, but it was in there to say that there was some variation in um, in the guidelines and and some of the. Uh, assumptions that were important were things about you mortality, and and there wasn't a well, there isn't a lot of uh, information about you mortality in the literature, and it wasn't something that the project was originally designed to to measure because we weren't expecting it to be a to be a driver of of the uh, of the findings because based on our experience with merinos where where mortality wasn't part of what drove the merino profile, um, but we we do know that those assumptions on mortality uh, have have some effect, and we also, as I talked about before, the the uh, the, the allocation of extra energy to either gaining protein or gaining fat had had some effect. Um, and that one had more effect on the, the feed budget on farm and how you would achieve the targets than it did on the actual targets themselves. There was also a few other things we didn't include or haven't included in this analysis. One of them was, was triplet management, but there is a project being carried out uh, looking at triplet managing triplets. Um, and, and so we may be able to have some more information on, on triplets when when that project is is completed. Um, so, just as a as a summary of of um, of what the economic analysis has showed is that that lambing is the the key target, and the targets are around condition score three for singles, and sort of three point three to three point five for twins, and that the joining target. It was not really a target, is that the condition score joining can be whatever's volunteered from the stocking rate and the seasonal conditions that that you're experiencing, provided that you can get back to the to the lambing targets without excessive weight loss. Um, and and we note that the the targets can't be achieved um, without scanning. 
So if we can throw that open to questions now, if there's um, any questions. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, uh, so I noticed, I noticed Steve, Steve Slater, Slater is typed, but, 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 but I can't see. Oh, oh. Got, some got some questions coming up. Coming up. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> not getting off scot free. <clears throat> <laughs> Typing skills. Slow and heavy. Hmm. Can we go? Oh, I guess that's an interesting comment that Steve makes that um, that has come up a few times is is the like we've Andrew said merinos aren't merinos and maternals aren't maternals. I guess the way we're thinking about it is that there's a there's a spectrum from sort of um, merino a traditional fine wool merino on one end through to a sort of more typical uh, maternal on the other. But there's but there's actually a full range and, and somewhere in the middle is is. Sort of as Steve says, a maternal merino, um, and, and at this stage we don't know whether the uh, for a maternal merino whether the merino guidelines are better or whether the the maternal guidelines um, are, are better are a better fit. Question, question from Alex. Yeah, Andrew might be able to talk about this a bit more as well, but the the initial finding is that that high U condition score at lambing is a which is good for for um, single sorry is good for twin lamb survival is is not good for triplet lamb survival. Um, so so that's starting to indicate that we don't want to allocate feed uh, to to triplets. During pregnancy, um, but we're we're still a, f a bit far away from being able to say what the rest of the profile should should look like at the moment. Uh, any other questions on that? On that? Uh, yes. Well, that that's a an interesting question that, and it's. I guess the way I'm thinking about it is that, that the, the maternals consume more feed than merinos and and so in the merino system the the driver of optimum stocking rate is more associated with being able to uh, consume more pasture whilst um, achieving your targets for your for your sheep so the, the problem is getting the sheep to eat enough and, and therefore putting more stock on uh, increases profitability quite directly. Whereas with the maternal, um, the, the optimum stocking rate is being driven more by your pasture targets than by your animal targets um, because the maternal has the capacity to, to reduce ground cover to the point where, where that becomes the driver of... Um, uh, of optimum stocking rate, so so utilising a high proportion of your pasture is not difficult. Utilising too much of your controlling utilisation of your pasture or being overutilised or overstocked is is the driver. Um, and which gross margin ends up being more more profitable depends a lot on on relative meat and wool prices. So um, I would expect at the moment that. Uh, that the maternal type sheep has has the advantage over the traditional um, the traditional wool merino, and but we don't have a lot of strong information on on the maternal merino, and and what sort of price scenario where where does it flip between the maternal merino and the and the maternal composite. <clears throat> great, great. Uh, 
Oh, oh at home we have another question. Question. Oh, this is oh, from, Andrew. from Andrew. I'll just publish, I'll just what, publish he what he says. So perhaps, so perhaps um, um, John, maybe John, if you can turn off the microphone. Oh, okay. Then Andrew can talk. Yeah. And I can't see. Can't see Andrew. So maybe Andrew, if you put on your video, so we can see you as well. No. I don't know what's what's happened there. He's, um, he seems to have gone out. Okay. Uh, well, unless there are any more questions for Andrew um, or for John, I know we have something in the chat box. Let's just go and have a look. From Steve. It's pretty hard to get some of those condition scores. Unless you have shares in the pellet company. Okay. In the in the trials, which went over four different locations with four different genotypes, the condition scores um, of four plus were, were quite common because the animals were gaining sort of upwards of 250 grams per head per day, uh, or the ewes were gaining that sort of weight which for a merino, you really only the, the lambs will gain that sort of rate. You won't get a ewe to, to gain so so fast. So um, so although the numbers seem high, it was what was being measured in the in the trials. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I think there are any other comments. I think we I might, think we might uh, say, say thank you very much to both, to both Andrew, Andrew and for a really, for a really, really interesting presentation. presentation. Um, um, be before you, before all, you go all go away, away I do have, I do a, have a, an evaluation, an evaluation survey. survey. If you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, mind completing that before you go. And just, and a, just reminder a reminder that I will, that I will be receiving a recording, recording of this webinar, webinar out, out to you next week. So, so I want to again, thank you very much to all of you for joining, joining us. And, and we look forward to We'll see you, see again. you again in our next webinar. webinar. Thanks very Thanks much. Very much.